Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the department seminar. So uh, today it's my great pleasure to um, welcome Hedwig Jellström, who is a professor in the Division of Robotics, Perception and Learning at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, in Sweden, where she was also a former department chair. Um, so Hedwig has done a lot of amazing works, uh, work in different areas of machine learning, including uh, computer vision, ML, robotics, information fusion, uh, cognitive science, speech, and so on, and uh, has written a lot of papers in these different fields. Um, she's been mainly active in computer vision, where she's also an associate editor for um, the uh, Transvection of uh, Pattern Analysis Machine Intelligence Journal, and um, also regularly serves as an area chair in, in many different venues. Uh, so with these words, let me just welcome Hedwig, and uh, yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. It's a pleasure to, to visit um, Irvine, although virtually. Um, so today I'm, uh, I will talk about a number of different projects in my group uh, that all are about representation learning in different ways. Um, so, um, so in interesting work from the group of Joshua Tenenbaum at MIT, it's pointed out that humans are able and forced by nature to learn from uh, very sparse data. So um, convolutional nets, uh, on the other hand, use lots of data. So um, you can imagine a state-of-the-art machine learning algorithm that is going to learn about uh, to recognize elephants in images. So you would train it with uh, a representative number of images of elephants, and then it could recognize a novel elephant. However, it has been shown in uh, cognitive experiments that a toddler, a really young child, can um, be given a drawing of an elephant um, and knowing having experience with like dogs and horses, it could understand that this is, uh, it's like a horse, but bigger with a trunk and bigger legs. And then it could recognize an elephant in an image, even though it has never seen an elephant. So, um, so apparently something very different is going on in this toddler's brain compared to what's going on in a neural network. And this has also been confirmed uh, in other experiments, for example, by uh, uh, Alison Gocknick, um, that children learn uh, iteratively and from very few examples. So, um, so Gopnik and Lake et al. and so on argue that we should uh, take the human example when designing learning systems, because it's, of course, it's a great bottleneck if you uh, need millions of data examples to uh, train a computer to recognize a new class of uh, objects, for example. Um, this was also advocated uh, by Alan Turing as early as 1950. So in his uh, great paper, Computing machinery and intelligence is mostly famous for the uh, Turing machine, but in section seven, it's actually the greatest part, I think. There he talks about that a computer should be designed to learn as a child. So, in the following, let's think of a learning system in the encoder decoder way. So you have some observations or data as input. Um, and then the system uh, learns an encoding function that encodes these data to some latent representation. And that could be decoded into um, some decisions. So it could either be a classification problem, a discrete problem, or it could be uh, some kind of re regression or mapping problem, so, sort of deciding uh, the motion of a robot based on its input or an autonomous car. 
So the key to this, uh, to the performance of this learning system, um, for example, for classification of objects, is the structure of this latent representation. So um, there is a whole new field that has grown uh, about representation learning. Um, so one of the founding people of representation learning, uh, Joshua Bangio, has advocated that um, the representation should be as uh, factorized as possible um, so that it is has as few parameters as possible. Um, or you could also say that it should be as disentangled as possible. Um, uh, but it should still explain the observed variation. So that's quite important. So it has to have the same uh, structure as the world which is which you want to model with this learning uh, system. Um, so it cannot be any factorization. It must be a factorization that corresponds to uh, true independences in the world. Um, another way to, another, um, it's basically the same thing, but another way to think about it is that the system should be, or sorry, the representation should be modular. Uh, so in Lake uh, et al, they give, um, they have a method that divides up the representation into modules that can then be combined in other ways. They, it's called probabilistic programs that can be combined in other ways. So it's a very efficient way of uh, learning a representation. So if the system has learned about bikes, it can easily learn about uh, another kind of novel wheeled um, uh, vehicle. And in work from, uh, from Stefan, uh, uh, you, you can also, it's very beneficial to uh, disentangle the representation as much as possible. Um, uh, so, uh, well, and I got lost. <laughs> uh, so basically, it's it's very important to um, uh, to understand the different factors of the data. So um, no, <laughs> I got a bit lost. I'm sorry. Um, it's, so it's basically important to have as few as parameters as possible and uh, it should be mechanistically similar to the world that you're modeling. So and uh, apart from these three works there are uh, a great number of interesting works but I don't have time to cover them all here. All right so um, but apart from, so, so my research is very much about uh, humans or computers understanding humans and humans understanding about computers. Um, so I have been interested in, can you, apart from these um, structural priors uh, based on sort of physics, you might say, um, can we get further insights into what representations human use? Uh, unfortunately, it's very hard to ask humans sort of what representations they have because it's not observable by the agent themselves, of course. But there are actually other ways of inspecting. So um, today I will talk about three strands of research in my group to representation learning guided by input from humans about how their inner representation of the world is structured. So for each one, I will give uh, an example of our work. Um, so the first one is um, observing, so humans, they observe dynamics in the world 
in different ways and observe the effect of actions and use this info to guide the latent representation. And um, so early work uh, that I did a decade ago uh, was very much about object affordances and functional object representations in terms of how they are used by humans. Um, more lately, we have been interested in causal uh, discovery to understand the cause effect relationships between different entities that you observe. Um, the second strand is um, to um, basically don't assume anything about the inner representation, but let the data guide. Uh, that, so, so you basically record data in a purposeful way and then you let the data guide the representation and then you can explore the representation afterwards. And we have applied this to um, horse behavior classification from video. And finally, you could also um, explicitly, in, so I will suggest two different ways of explicitly um, recording what is going on in the human latent representation and then use that, this recording, you can see it as a second observation sort of of the, the whole uh, process. Um, and let uh, supervise the learning with this extra information as well. Yes, so let's move to the first, uh, observing dynamics in the world and modeling function. So this corresponds um, basically to generative modeling. So you wanna model the process of how the data has occurred. So the process that has generated the data um, and the mechanisms behind that. So I will first mention 10-year-old um, work about affordances, and then I will proceed to newer work on causal discovery. So, one, uh, one thing to do when developing an object perception mechanism for a robot is to use knowledge about uh, humans and animals perceive objects. So there has been quite a lot of research on um, how um, living creatures uh, see the world in a way that is purposeful for them. And this has very much to do with that the agent, the perceiving agent has an embodiment and has a goal sort of uh, wants to do something. So, um, so Gibson in 1979 um, established the concept of affordance. So according to affordance concept, um, if you wanna sit down, I mean, humans are, uh, not like birds, so we have a lot of other cognitive functions, but, but we use affordances daily. So if we wanna sit down, we look for, uh, not um, primarily for a certain kind of sitable object, but maybe for somewhere where we can sit. Or if we wanna um, um, pour a glass of water, we look for a container that could be uh, poured into and, um, and we can drink from a glass and a cup and so on. And we can uh, read from a, uh, from a newspaper or a book, but we, if we want to hammer in a nail, it, it, we might want to use a hammer, but it could also do with something heavy that it, doesn't have this purpose primarily, but it affords hammering. So it could, a book could be seen as hammerable and readable. And this is not, um, it's not possible always to find affordances just from looking at objects, unless you have learned about them. So for example, um, a book and a, a magazine um, so the book is heavy, 
so it can be used to hammer in a nail, but the magazine cannot. So in general, you cannot learn about the affordances of a novel object just by looking at it, but you can either you can experience it yourself if you have an embodiment, or you can look at another agent using it, and then you can um, learn about affordances and associate affordances with looks. Uh, so I will not go into detail about this, these projects, but uh, there is uh, the main paper is cited here. So more lately, um, or more generally, one would like to understand about cause effect relationships in data. So um, like in the foreign function case, um, we want the representation to encode and make use of assumptions on the process which generated the data. So, uh, and I believe this is a key ingredient in any human-like representation learning model to understand the causal mechanisms behind the observed data. So in this case, for example, we see an image of a cow on grass, uh, and there is in the daytime. And this is are things that we can see in the image. Um, and then we can get a much, much more robust model <laughs> if we make assumptions about, uh, it's like the grass hasn't caused the cow to come there, but uh, it hasn't sort of actively called the cow there, but the cow has seen the grass and gone there because the cows like to be in the grass and the cows are not out on the grass in the nighttime. So, uh, so it's because of the daylight that the cow has come there. Um, sorry, that, that arrow should go, go in the other direction, I realize now. Um, and what you can get out of um, these kind of causal models apart um, in, in contrast to normal models where you just have an undirected graph is that you can uh, have an explanation. So like, why is the, why do we see uh, a cow uh, or why, do, um, yeah. So why is the cow there? Yes, it's because he, they like the grass. And you can also do counterfactual reasoning. If you have seen cows, um, if you have seen different environments and there are more cows on grass, then you can reason about what if I had concrete there, would it be probable that I saw a cow? So, so it allows you to do many things. So my student Ru Bu and a former student of mine, uh, Chong, Tsang, uh, who is also a former colleague of Stefan, by the way, uh, focus on this area. So in the work I describe here, we extend the PC algorithm for causal discovery. Uh, the causal discovery is to discover the cause effect relationships uh, among variables that you observe given observations. Uh, so it's very simplified, looks like this. So you start off with um, you're observing the variables A, B, C, and D, E, and E. <laughs> and uh, so you start off with assuming that they are all connected. And then you um, check which ones are conditionally independent and you remove the edge between them. And you also make assumptions on um, sinks, so like variables that cannot cause anything else. So um, for example, the, uh, yeah, the outcome of a, of a test, for example, it cannot have caused anything else because it's measured last, for example. So um, if you know the sink, you know that arrows point towards that sink. And then you can iteratively go through the graph and make assumptions about edges. So I'm not going to go into detail exactly what, how, but you can iteratively go through the graph 
or sorry, recursively go, go through the graph and recover uh, the edges. And this works if you have perfect observations, but what if, if there is uh, missing data, uh, which is a very common phenomenon, for example, in healthcare data that you have uh, you have a number of patients and you have done a number of tests on these patients, but different doctors have done slightly different tests. And for some patients, the test was uh, not readable and so on. So yeah, there is often very much missing data. And the problem is that this data is, um, it's not missing completely at random. It's, there are patterns behind the missingness. So a common solution, I mean, a, a simple solution would be to remove all patients which have incomplete measurements. Another solution might be to remove all measurements which have missing data. But both these, um, strategies are not uh, waterproof because there might be correlation between other measurements and the missingness of a certain measurement. And if you then remove uh, certain patients or certain um, um, uh, tests, um, then you introduce a bias in the data. So how to avoid this? So our contribution is that we introduce a strategy for removing missing data where we make sure to not have any bias, to not introduce any novel bias in the data. So essentially what we do, so here are why is the missingness indicator of y. It's basically an, a Boolean that says if y is missing or not. And this, um, so a pathological case is that ry is dependent on y, then it's impossible to solve this. But we can, uh, I mean, a very common case is that the missingness of y depends on something else, for example, z, uh, so that uh, for example, uh, patients that are embarrassed about uh, admitting something, um, for example, alcohol consumption, then you can assume that they will have a higher likelihood of not reporting alcohol consumption if they have a high alcohol consumption. Um, no, that was the pathological case, sorry. Um, they might have a um, higher probability of reporting something else or of not reporting something else. So for example, if the alcohol consumption is Z and Y is something else, then the missingness of Y will depend on the alcohol consumption. And therefore it's important not just to remove the patients with the missing Y, because that will also introduce a bias in Z. So the intuitive idea is to detect the cause of the missingness and then marginalize out this variable so that uh, the, so that we remove data points uh, in a way that is independent of this variable. So we can introduce this uh, middle step in uh, the PC algorithm. So basically we, um, we uh, compensate in the graph for these missingness indicators. So we put in extra edges to cut out the dependency between missingness and, and uh, the cause of the missingness. And that allows us to remove um, data points in a way that doesn't introduce bias uh, for other variable distributions. And then you can do this orientation reasoning. 
and that uh, yeah so we showed that this gave better per classification performance and so on. So in the future um, this is all very good that you can deal with um, I mean incomplete data and so on but we have still assumed that we observe everything that is interesting that there are some observations but what if there are unobserved factors? For example, in this cow case, maybe you thought there was something fishy in my uh, very simplistic graph. Yes, probably it was because the cows don't make decisions by themselves to go out and eat grass. The, there is a farmer who owns the cows and they, the farmer decide to, to bring the cow out to the grass and they do it in the daytime and then they bring the cows in at night. So that's the, uh, it's called an unknown confounder and it's very important to detect that and it's highly non-trivial of course. And also how to handle uncertainty both in the values and also in the um, structure of the graph and that is also an open problem. Yes, yeah, so the second strand, um, by the way, are there any questions? Please stop me if I'm, mm. if you have any questions, just, but I don't see the chat, unfortunately, while I'm talking, so. Yeah, um, so yes. feel free to post your, your questions on the, on the chat, and if there are some urgent questions, I'll just read them for you, and uh, Excellent. you might be able to answer. Excellent. That's, that's a good uh, strategy. All right, in the meantime, I continue here. Um, so the second strand uh, research is end-to-end um, uh, -end learning uh, or where you let the data guide the learning. So let the data speak for themselves with as few assumptions as possible. And this, is uh, intended, so we use this strategy when we have a representation, so we want to mimic a representation that we don't know so much about, so there is, it's very hard to have any assumptions about what it looks like. So what we want to model is a highly complex skill, it's, uh, and a veterinarian um, looking at horses and uh, deciding if they are in pain or not. And it could also be other similar things if they have some illness or if they are lame and so on. Um, yes, yeah, so basically what we want to model is some, uh, they call it often clinical eye, or you can also call it gut feeling. It's like an internalized um, skill that they have learned from years of training and it's not possible to ask the vet uh, like what you base your decision on because they sort of feel uh, things so they have apparently there is a lot going on in their brain yes so our strategy is then to not have very much um, ideas about what's going on. Instead, we make sure to have a lot of observations and to uh, fairly sample or sort of evenly sample the observation space or have, uh, sort of make sure that there are no biases in the observation space. And it's also very important with the ground truth. So, um, I mean, you can make use of unlabeled data as well for learning um, certain aspects of the representation, but, uh, but it's very important to have labeled data where you can trust uh, the ground truth label. So just shortly to motivate why we are looking at horses in pain, because it's not, of course, this research involves uh, putting horses in pain uh, and measuring how they behave. So it's important to say that it's, um, it's a really, really 
important task. So um, it's very common to um, um, that you have to end horses' lives because of disorders that could have been treated at an earlier stage, could you have detected that they were ill or injured. And veterinarians are not very good. They say themselves that they are not very good at scoring pain. So traditionally, they are looking at biomechanics rather than pain. They're looking at if the horse is limping, sort of. And horses also tend to hide their pain because it's not sort of beneficial for them to appear ill because that will uh, to, uh, to have a heightened interest. So they, um, they are sort of genetically inclined to uh, have a stiff upper lip. So it's very hard to see on a horse if they are doing badly. Um, so I collaborate with um, veterinarians at uh, the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, north of Stockholm. And they have a really interesting uh, research there where they, which is very novel in the veterinary domain. So they systematically collect data, uh, which they analyze both for research purposes, but also for the, um, the clinic. So in, in the clinical practice. So they systematically um, sort of objectively measure uh, limping, uh, for example, instead of just looking at the horses you, you measure with mocap. And they also collect data from machine learning and collaborate with us. Um, so they do mocap of horses trotting to detect irregularities and so what is interesting here is that they record video facial expression and body posture to analyze the behavior and with known ground truth. So there are basically two ways of getting data with ground truth for this pain analysis. So the first one is to, so there are a lot of horses coming through their clinic for different kinds of operations for example, in the stomach or the legs, um, where you know, uh, you know the condition of the horse. So you, so you have a pretty good idea of what they are experiencing based on sort of what has happened to them during the operation. So they have had uh, different um, um, stitches and so on. Um, so they do a lot of uh, video recordings or post-operation and um, they know, so it's a combination of expert labeling afterwards and also getting ground truth. They know they give the horses painkillers, of course, after operations. So they know exactly when they have given painkillers. Um, but still it's, um, the labeling is very uncertain because the, as I said before, the veterinarian, the veterinarians are not very good at scoring pain. So the expert looking at the video has a quite hard time to labeling the pain. Um, but the good thing is that you get very large volumes of data. So it's basically, you can record all the horses under treatment in the hospital. And it's the largest animal hospital in Sweden. So it has quite a lot of horses. And I should also say, point out that this is very, very um, uh, strongly ethically regulated. So owners have given consent and there has been ethical applications. So the other way of uh, collecting data is to do, do controlled studies. This is also what you do um, when you test uh, drugs for example, in humans. So you, you have a control groups that you give sugar pills and then you give the drug to another control group and then you measure the outcome. So here it's really important to say that this is also very strongly ethically regulated and there is no, nothing done to the horses that will harm them. So they, but they induce pain in different ways. So for example, they get chili paste on the skin, which gives a burning feeling. 
or they have a cuff on the leg and that gives a, a pain, sense of pain. And it's also used in human studies for inducing pain. The good thing about this uh, is that you have a very, very accurate ground truth. You know exactly what, uh, how much pain was inflicted and so on. You don't, it's an interesting discussion uh, whether you know what the horse is experiencing because of course you don't know what the horse is experiencing. You, you can only measure sort of the, I think it's called a nociceptic um, pain. Um, basically the, the medical processes in the body. Uh, but the downside is that you have very sparse measurements because of course, like in any other intervention study, you wanna minimize the number of trials. So uh, it's a trade-off between sort of data volume and ground truth accuracy. All right. Um, my PhD student, Sofia Bromé, is working on an end-to-end -end deep learning approach to pain de de detection from video using uh, the, the kind of data I described. Um, so we started out with a mm, two stream convolutional LSTM and it's, um, I mean, um, it's uh, to calibrate the difficulty of the task, we compare to veterinarians. So we let experts label videos of horses and label whether or not they were uh, under pain stimulation. And they had a much worse performance than our model, which maybe doesn't say very much about the model. It rather says that this problem is extremely difficult. Um, currently, uh, we're developing um, um, a multi-instance learning method to recognize uh, sort of situations where you have vague and sparsely occurring signs that occur now and then. And also we are developing methods to overcome labeling errors because of this problem with expert labeling, as I said before, and also strategies for semi and self-supervised learning to sort of uh, depend less on label data. So, but maybe more interesting uh, is what does the network learn? So you can uh, use GradCam, which is a, a quite st a standard method nowadays for uh, looking at uh, what a, a neural network attends to in an image. And then you can see um, it's quite hard to draw conclusions, of course, but there are indications that the network observes things that we know are relevant for the pain expression, such as the muscle uh, what, uh, or the nose of the horse. Uh, so in the first, uh, let's see here, it looks at, very much at the muscle and it looks at the eyes. Uh, both there and here. It looks at the eyes and the eyes have a lot of information. Um, yeah, which, and there is also temporal consistency on where it looks. So it doesn't look at random places all the time. So it gives us a bit more confidence in the model, but there is a long way to go. So we have also developed a more elaborate video inspection methods uh, that we'll use from now on. But um, yeah, so we'll continue working on um, better end-to-end -end learning methods and better and better inspection methods. And the purpose is to um, sort of trying to extract uh, as much information from, uh, first of all, trying to um, develop as competent end-to-end -end models as possible, uh, and then develop as competent inspection methods as possible. And it would be really interesting to see if we could start getting out information about uh, does the model attend to the same cues as 
veterinarians are doing since the 1800s? Um, or can you inform the veterinary training and practice in some way using these models? And of course, it's good to um, sort of regularize or um, sort of harness the network in different ways to um, make do with less data, for example. But there is a trade-off between if you harness it too much, then, uh, then it will not be able to pick up very fine details in the data. Yes, and the third um, thing that you could do is that you could um, explicitly try to um, uh, sort of look at what is happening in the brain. So basically peek into the brain of the perceiving human. This is a bit more flaky because it's a very, very hard task. But, um, but the idea that we wa uh, wanna use is to basically observe also aspects about the latent representation. And you can use that to supervise the learning of the latent representation in the automatic system or in the computer model. So it's kind of what I joked about in the beginning to look directly at the representation and sort of ask the human. Um, so one example is the work of another student of mine, Olga Mikieva. Um, so if you take a look at these faces, so in terms of facial geometry, the first face is closer uh, to the reference. So the uh, x0 is the reference and x1 is closer in terms of geometry, like the mouth is closed and so on. But the second, um, if you um, look at it as a human, uh, you sort of see the, the, the two, uh, the face uh, zero and two, they have a more, uh, that person looks genuinely happy while uh, the person one looks kind of um, wry or uh, a bit, uh, yeah, you don't really know. Maybe he's a bit sad or he's not entirely happy. But anyway, a human would probably perceive H, uh, zero and two to be closer. So we would, um, so uh, uh, what we would like to do is to have force. Uh, so if we would train a VAE with just uh, 3D points from all faces, they, uh, the latent representation would surely put these two faces closer to each other in the representation. If they were projected into the representation, they would be closer because they are closer in terms of geometry. But it would be much nicer for facial recognition tasks if the representation put these two faces closer together because their expressions is closer in a sort of emotional meaning. So, we decided to peek into uh, average, the average uh, human representation. So what we did was that we crowdsourced. So we asked loads of people online uh, to rank triplets like this so in terms of distance. So they should say, so is phase one or two closer to phase zero? And this corresponds to sampling from an average human latent representation of facial expression. And we use this, so that we use this sampled uh, representation. You could think of it as small topological um, data points, sort of triplets of distances, or sorry, um, duplets, uh, tuples of distances. Uh, could use it to guide uh, training of a latent VA representation. So this is what we did. So we 
uh, we showed the encoder firstly to remove um, sort of dependence on um, variation between individuals. We showed both a neutral face and uh, different expressions of uh, the same individual to, to force the network to focus on the changes that were not dependent on the individual, but on facial expression. And then we added a topological prior. We, I'm not gonna go into detail about what, how it's expressed, but we basically rewarded representations which respected the topology of these small triplets or tuples of distances that we had collected for people. Yes, and uh, so we're just now starting a project. So if it weren't for COVID, <laughs> we would have started already, but uh, we're soon um, with the perceptual neuroscience department at Karolinska Institute, the medical hospital here in Stockholm, on modeling the connection between brain activity and approach avoidance behavior in connection to uh, smell stimuli. Um, so this corresponds to an even more direct way of measuring the latent uh, representation in the perceiving human. So you actually, instead of asking sampling from a large population of humans, you're measuring much more about the brain activity of one specific human or the specific human that is doing the behavior and you're also measuring over time while the human is doing the behavior. So here the behavior, the facial expression and the head motion is, uh, is not the input to the system we're modeling but the output instead. So it's uh, the input is the smell stimuli, and then something happens in the human brain that causes the human uh, to behave in a certain way. And what my colleague at uh, Karolinska is interested in is um, the mechanisms behind approach avoidance behavior um, um, in the human brain in connection to smell. Uh, while I'm of course interested in, in the, uh, the modeling. Uh, so to, uh, so I'm interested, so we're gonna work with uh, VAEs um, following the previous project, but also um, normalizing flow models, uh, for example. Yes. And that sums up what I would like to talk uh, about today. So in summary, um, it has been shown that humans learn modularly and from few examples, and that many argue, and I think they are completely right, that it, it's very beneficial to um, follow that examples and let computers learn uh, in the same way. And the key to, uh, to achieving this is the latent representations. You must focus on uh, guiding the, the learning of the latent representation to make it human-like. So I propose three strategies to doing this. One is to observe dynamics in the world, either through uh, actually observing um, uh, dynamics or by um, reasoning about uh, the statistics of data and do causal discovery, for example, um, to make a generative model so that the representation um, captures the cause effect relationships of what they see. So basically infers uh, 
what has uh, what causal mechanisms have caused what uh, the system is observing. Um, the other thing um, is to uh, the, the other uh, thing that I think uh, we should focus on is to uh, put a lot of effort in what data, how we record data to train the model. There is also a, a whole field which I haven't <laughs> mentioned at all, but uh, that is about uh, generating training data, uh, uh, synthetic training data in different ways. I just, yesterday I found a paper from, uh, from iClear, from Andreas Geiger and a student where uh, where they construct counterfactual images of like cows floating in space or uh, orange um, uh, hammers in the sea or something. Uh, it's like images that you cannot observe, but the, the purpose of training, augmenting the data with such counterfactual data is to disentangle different factors that otherwise would have been completely uh, entangled. For example, that cows are always observed on the grass. You don't, you cannot really uh, sort out why and uh, is it because the grass is connected to the cow somehow. Um, so you can do a lot by purposely fully uh, designed the data um, collection and generation. And thirdly, uh, there are some situations where you can actually measure the aspects of the latent representation and basically have observations that supervise the data we are. Thank you so much. I want to thank all my, uh, all my students and uh, also all the collaborators that if you're doing uh, cross-disciplinary research, you have to collaborate with a lot of people and it takes quite a lot of effort uh, to collaborate, for example, with um, geriatricians about Alzheimer um, analysis, which I haven't talked about, but, but I find it very stimulating to, uh, to have interdisciplinary collaboration. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Hedvig. That was a really interesting talk. You covered a lot of different topics. Um, so for all our audience, please just you know, type your questions into the chat. And um, you know, let me then kind of select some of your questions to ask them. Uh, maybe you kind of get started. Um, <clears throat> mm -hmm. So one question that I found interesting was this part on horses in pain. Um, Mm -hmm. Have you carefully analyzed which, you know, if there's more information in the in the video or in the dynamics, or if it's actually sufficient to look at static uh, images also? Um, yeah, so so we did that. Uh, I can go back maybe. Mm. So that's one of the things we tried. Um, I think it's this. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, no, it's no, sorry, it's not. Um, I should know, but uh, basically it, it's like random performance. It's uh, impossible to tell anything. There is a lot of information in, in motion. Mm. Um, however, um, I have another project where we uh, detect facial action units in horses and there are um, so if you have this kind of end-to-end -end approach, the network would never find such fine details, I think. But if you force it to focus on the area around the eye, for example, there is a lot of information in the shape of the eye that is static. So you can detect it from one image. Um, so there is a fax system called Equifax developed for horses that is completely analogous to, to humans. So there is, for example, facial action units that indicate mm -hmm. pain. Interesting. 
Mm. All right, so then uh, Hamza is actually asking a question. So um, mm. I think I haven't understood well how the analysis of comparing geometry and emotions uh, works, I guess. Um, and the second one being, yeah, um, the second one being the one that translates to more human late representations. So maybe kind of a quick summary of how this, this project worked mm. where you kind of did the, uh, the human yes. rankings. Yeah. Yes, <clears throat> um, I sort of described almost nothing uh, about many things. So um, I left out a lot. Um, so let's see. Yes, so essentially if, um, um, so in this paper, so the, the, the first baseline that we tried was to just train uh, train it like this, but without the topological prior. Oh, the very first baseline was without the neutral image, but that is actually quite good because it sort of disentangles identity differences from emotional differences. So let's start off from that. So if you remove the topological prior and you just have your normal Gaussian prior, on the latent space, then you have introduced no other information than that it should learn how to. Um, so, so we represent the faces in terms of uh, 3D landmarks on the face, which are detected with a standard method. Um, so it would, two faces that are close in terms of landmark, geometrically close, such as uh, these two faces are the landmarks of the upper and lower lip are close together, for example. This uh, will cause these two um, images to end up closer together in the representation than these two images because of this um, the proportion between the difference, the distance from upper to lower lip and the distance from, uh, I don't know, um, upper lip to nose. It's um, larger uh, than for these two, so therefore it will be larger. But if you introduce this other prior, then you also, the loss then will uh, depend on whether what uh, what humans have thought about this triplet. So imagine that uh, humans have labeled exactly these triplet. So there there is human information that uh, says that uh, yeah, but these two faces are much more similar in terms of emotional expression than these two faces. So then um, the training will have um, made the representation such that when you project in these three images, these two will end up closer together because that's how the, um, the topology of the latent representation will have ended up. So it has tried to um, sort of um, obey all these triplets that humans have uh, provided it with. So I guess the latent space is sort of informed by some sort of additional ranking loss, right? That, uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. So we call it a topological prior, but you can see it as a uh, it's a ranking loss that that uh, gives it a punishment whenever uh, a triplet gives a different. Uh, so if you project in, if you have a certain triplet and you project it into the latent representation and the ranking is different from what humans think, then you have a punishment for that representation. So the optimization will uh, sort of steer away from such representations mm -hmm. and end up with a representation which respects most of these 
uh, user, uh, crowdsourced uh, user rankings. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, thank you mm -hmm. so much for, oh, did somebody ask a question here? No, I was saying thank you. Okay, thanks. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think our time is up. So uh, thank you so much for your <clears throat> interesting talk. And I think we learned about a bunch of different projects and um, pretty excited to follow up with you. And thank yeah. you again. See you yes, everyone. Thanks. All right. Thank you.